Hi everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Today I'm delighted to be speaking with Alan Stein Jr. Alan is a performance coach, consultant, speaker and author. He spent 15 years working with some of the highest performing basketball players on the planet. And none other than Kevin Durant had this to say about him. Kevin said... Alan played a huge role in my development on and off the court, and his guidance helped me get to where I am today. High praise indeed. Alan now spreads his messages far and wide across sports and into the corporate world. This guy's got some great stories about some great players, and he's also got a new book out. It's called Raise Your Game, and we're going to be talking about the book in this episode. We actually met after being invited to speak together on a different podcast, and it's fair to say that we got on famously. So I'm really looking forward to this. Without further ado, Alan, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah, I was uh, equally excited um, you know, to, to have this opportunity. I had an absolute blast with you on that other show. I, I knew that we'd hit it off and uh, looking forward to a fun conversation. Yeah, well, it really worked well, I thought, and uh, we we shared a lot of the same views about uh, performance coaching and and sports psychology and the mental side of 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 sport. And um, what I'm fascinated uh, about, Alan, is uh, I'd actually like to start by going back in time. Um, how did all of this start for you, mate? When did it start? Where did it start? Where did your obsession with high performance start? How did it start? What was that catalyst? Well, if we go back to the very beginning, basketball was my first identifiable passion. Uh, I fell in love with the game at probably five or six years old and was very thankful that I played a variety of different sports and did a ton of different activities. You know, everything from skateboarding and BMX biking uh, to martial arts to your more conventional uh, sports of, of soccer and, and football and basketball. Uh, but basketball is always what I came back to. So that was definitely my first love. Um, and as I started to get older and through junior high and high school and being very serious about the game and wanted the college level, uh, I started to look for um, every advantage I could possibly get, which certainly led me down the path of strength conditioning and improving my athleticism in my body, uh, but also led me down the path of, of the mental side and improving mindset and, and so forth. Uh, so I started to get the itch probably late in high school and then started to turn up the volume in both of those domains in college. Uh, I was able to play at a school uh, in North Carolina, uh, play basketball there, and really started, again, uh, just fascinated with, with everything performance related. And, and I will say that in the beginning of my career, I leaned way heavily on the the athleticism side, on the body side. You know, I spent most of my time trying to figure out how to make the human body stronger and more efficient and more powerful. Um, but then as I got older and more mature and had more experience and started to see what real high performers did, uh, it became crystal clear to me that the mind was the only key that could unlock all of that performance, that it didn't matter, you know, how much skill you had or how athletic you were, uh, if you didn't have the right mindset or you didn't have the mental skills, then there was still a, a very low ceiling on how good you could be. Um, so then I, I started to pivot into study that stuff. You know, what, what you're such an expert in, um, I, I started to, to, to read and watch and listen to as much in your area mm. as I could. And I found the return on that investment was tenfold. So... Um, you know, it's been a pretty long journey for me now. I'm 43 years old, uh, so I've been around the game of basketball and around sport and around performance for almost my entire life. And so what happened after college? Did, did you go into employment? Did you go into coaching? What happened after college? I, went, I became a, a performance coach. So I became a basketball performance coach. Of course, at that time, it was more referenced as a strength and conditioning coach. Um, but uh, I, I basically started my own business and was training youth and high school athletes here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, so I was part entrepreneur and part business owner, um, but, but definitely a performance coach. And again, at that stage, you know, everything was about exercises and sets and reps and 
periodization and, and how can I design the perfect program? And, and while that stuff is still important, you know, I just didn't pay enough attention to how important the mind was. And, and that only came again with some age and experience. Uh, but it ended up making my physical training so much more effective when I felt that I could address the mental side as well. When you reflect back on your own sporting life, your 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 basketball playing in college, if you were to get, get sort of climb into a time machine and and take yourself back, a magic time machine, and take yourself back, what would you do differently? Um, you said you were very preoccupied with the physical side, and perhaps you wished you had done more on the mental side. When you look back, what what would you have done differently, and how much impact do you think that would have made? Well, that is the biggest difference. You just hit it. I would have, I would have been open to and embraced the mental side uh, much earlier. Mm-hmm. Now, now, in fairness, it's kind of you know we don't know what we don't know. So when I was in high school, I had no idea that there was this treasure chest of of things that I I could have accessed to improve my performance. I didn't know that. Um, you know, I remember uh, one of the first books I ever read was uh, on the subject was a book called Mind Gem. Um, yep. and, and, and really that was the first time that it dawned on me that this was uh, a kind of an, an entire niche, an entire angle to improve performance that had nothing to do with the physicality. And that was really kind of the spark. So if I would have been able to read that book earlier in my career, or if I would have been able to meet someone like you or be coached by someone like you, um, I, I do think it could have had a profound impact. I mean, um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm of decent stature. I'm 6'1", 180 pounds. I would say, you know, an average athlete, certainly not elite by any means, but, but, but fairly decent. Um, but I think I could have, you know, I could have maximized myself so much better had I been aware of, of the, the mental tools that, that, that you have and that you share. Could it have led to the pro ranks? I don't think I would have been able to be a pro player, but I think I would have been a much higher level college player and definitely would have had a better high school career. Um, but way more important than that, I mean, because, again, I don't believe that I have the, the genetic potential to play uh, professionally, which which is OK. But what that would have done, if I would have if I would have learned the stuff that you share as a player, yep. I think it would have made me a much more of effective coach earlier in my coaching career, um, you know, the, the, the things that I feel like I have a decent understanding of and appreciation now at 43, if I would have had a better appreciation and understanding of that stuff at 23, I think I would have been a much more effective coach earlier. Um, but again, these things are all in the rearview mirror and, and I can't wave that magic wand and change them. So I'm just thankful now that I'm aware of guys like you and your teachings and I'm able to adopt that not only to the folks I work with, but on my own personal life. No, but you know, because I, I, I've been asked that a few times by uh, soccer coaches over in England when they when they sort of because my background was I was a professional golfer, and they, they'll always say to me when I talk to them about the, the mental side of the game, they ask me what difference it would have made to my career, and I said, look, I probably wouldn't have got into the world's top hundred. I certainly wouldn't have been Tiger Woods, but you know what? I would have, as a professional, I would have won more money. And yeah. I would have had a lot more fun on the golf course, yes, that's for sure. Yes, exactly. You know, and I'm sure you'd say the same. You would have had a lot more fun on the basketball court. Without question. I mean, it would alleviate a lot of the stress. I mean, yeah. you know, I find, and I know you and I touched on that in our previous conversation, that most, at least in my own experience, most anxiety and stress comes from either the past or the future. It's very rarely stressful in the present moment. I mean, assuming I'm not, you know, standing in the middle of a fire or something, but it's looking back on the past and wishing I could change something or be anxious and worried about the future, which isn't even guaranteed. That's where most stress and anxiety comes from. So just living and being at peace in the present moment, um, you know, whether I'm doing this interview or I'm in the middle of a basketball game, there's a nice serenity and inner peace about the present moment. And, and for me, you know, that, that, that would have absolutely made everything a lot more fun, uh, a lot more enjoyable, but I do think would have raised performance significantly. 
Well, we're certainly going to talk more about staying in the present moment, but um, what I know is that when you left college and you became a performance coach and you got into the mental side and you were working with a lot of athletes, a lot of basketball players, that you were um, working with and um, getting to know a lot of very good players. And uh, I know that you spent some time with Kevin Durant. In fact, you may have worked with him. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, so you can you can enlighten us on that one. And um, when I did a podcast with you, and you'll have to excuse me here, I do apologise, but you 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 um, recounted a fantastic story about the commitment, and I can't remember if it was Kobe Bryant or LeBron James. So please, it was just, Kobe. It was Kobe. It was Kobe. I yes. thought it was. So um, tell me tell me about great basketball players because you know what uh, uh, lots of people in in the US uh, listen to this but lots of people in the UK and we all love basketball and but I don't know enough about it so tell me about what some of the best players do over there to be the best that they can be Absolutely. Well, you know, where, where I'm very thankful in my career is I've been able to see elite players from two different vantage points. Uh, one, I was able to work with a dozen or so NBA players when they were in junior high and high school, and Kevin Durant was one of them. So I was able to to get a chance to see them when they were literally kids before they became the icons that we all know now. So that's that's one level of player. And then uh, that led me to do some work with Nike and with Jordan Brand and with USA Basketball, which then allowed me to observe and watch and see behind the curtain of some already incredibly established players like Stephen Curry and Anthony Davis and Kyrie Irving and LeBron James and Kobe Bryant. So uh, it was really neat for me to see both, you know, see what it looked like before they became great and then see some other players after they were already great but be privy to kind of what they do during the unseen hours and you know in basketball uh, I always refer to the unseen hours as when you know the the lights are off the cameras aren't rolling and the cheerleaders aren't dancing it's what you do then that will determine how well you play you know when the lights are on and the referee blows the whistle so you know in both cases uh, I saw tons of of similarities Um, one of the most important similarities is that the best never get bored with the basics, that they have a strong respect and appreciation for the fundamentals, um, whether it's the fundamentals of of shooting, passing, and rebounding, uh, whether it's the fundamentals of footwork and movement and athleticism, or if it's the fundamentals of, you know, the mental side and living in the present moment and focusing on what you can control, you know, they embrace those fundamentals and they never leave them. And, you know, to me, that's, uh, that's incredibly inspiring to know that the, the guys that, that do the most amazing stuff on the court still really embrace the basics, and, and I love that. I think that's fascinating. Um, and when you reflect back and you watched those players execute the fundamentals day in, day out, every day, every day, every day. What did, was there anything specific that you recall that they did to help them do that? Was it literally they did it and they just did it and they just overcame any kind of boredom that there might be? Or did they love basketball so much or were they so engaged in mastery? Or did they actually, you know, make the activities around the fundamentals more interesting or more vibrant and more engaging? Was there a secret formula there for one or two of them? Well, you know, each player was a little bit different, but Mm. generally speaking, it was kind of a a perfect storm and accumulation of everything that you just mentioned. You know, part of it was... This is this is work that needs to be done, and if I if I connect myself to my why and my purpose, which is to be the best player that I'm capable of, then this is not a nice to have. This is a requirement, so I have to do it. Uh, that would be one angle. Uh, another would be they understand. I mean, this is the path to mastery. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got to put in the time and I've got to get in the reps. And if I'm going to do this, is one thing that absolutely separates high performers. If I'm going to do it then I may as well do it to the best of my ability. See, I think, I think average people just, they, they just go through the motions. They just mail it in. Yeah, okay, I've got to do some footwork, so I'm going to kind of half-ass it and just kind of, of go through it. No, that's not how they do it. If a high performer says, if I'm going to be in the gym and if I'm going to do this drill, then I'm going to do it with as much precision and care and effort and focus as possible. I'm going to get something out of this. Uh, and then, of course, there are some other ways you know, that they could try to think, make things uh, more fun or more enjoyable um, and and they would certainly do that but the other thing too is uh, and I know you have an appreciation for if you're going to be consistent 
then it doesn't mean that you have to spend hours and hours every day working on the basics. You know, you can accomplish a lot of work in 15 to 20 minutes as long as it's deliberate, focused practice and you're getting in the right type of reps. So this doesn't mean that a player like Kevin Durant has to do basic footwork drills for 60 minutes a day. Maybe it's only 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But when you do something for 10 minutes, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for your entire career, well, then it all starts to add up. So I think it's kind of the perfect storm of everything that you, you just mentioned with such great insight. What I hear you say is those players uh, wanted to be the best player they could be. They were engaged in mastery, um, uh, and that mastery included a form of deliberate practice. Now, what I think is fascinating is that you were exposed to a a player like Kevin Durant um, pre-fame, if you like, or pre-NBA, even pre-college. Um, was Kevin, did he always have that? Was there a shift at some stage? What was he like before the stardom? Well, when I first met him and I watched him play, I don't know, maybe for five minutes. And in that quick of a time, I made the following evaluation. One, this kid, uh, he has very high skill level. Like he, his, his shooting form, his footwork, I mean, it's, it's pristine. Uh, two, he has a very high basketball IQ. Even at 15, he really understood the game on a cerebral level uh, that rivaled most coaches. Three, he had a motor and he had a passion. He just loved to play. I mean, he was playing as hard as he could, and he had a smile on his face the whole time. Uh, but four, uh, he was he was rather gangly. I mean, he was he was six nine at the time, probably 175 pounds. So he was really skinny, and it was clear that. That was going to be the limiting factor for him to play at the next level. It wasn't going to be from lack of skill. It wasn't going to be from lack of understanding of the game. And it definitely wasn't going to be from lack of passion. But when you get to the college level, as you know, and then eventually the pros, I mean, you're playing with men, big, strong, powerful men. So I knew that he needed to get get stronger. Uh, But he had all of the raw materials in place um, to be a great player. He was humble. He was coachable, uh, but he still mixed that with a nice confidence. I mean, he was confident on the court, but he was never too big that he wouldn't listen or look a coach in the eye. Um, and, and, and so, you know, if you would have asked me then, did I think he would end up being one of the top players in the world? If I answered honestly, there's no way I could have predicted that. But at the same time, I'm not even remotely surprised that he is one of the top players because he had those intangible characteristics. And, and again, it goes back to the, the work ethic blended with being coachable. Um, and when you already have that type of genetic talent and natural born talent, mm. you know, th- there's, no, there's no ceiling on what you can, can achieve. That's really interesting because you said within that f- that first five minutes, and, and and you're somebody who's grown up playing basketball and 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 surrounding yourself within the game, so you'll have that vision, that eye, if you like, that gut feeling for what you see, and. You you said you saw somebody who's highly skillful, um, who has a passion for the game, who had a, a, an unusual understanding of the game, even at that sort of 15 years of age. He was gangly, though. And, and so was it that physicality that made you stand back and go, oh, you know, this kid can be really good, but he's going to have to really do something physically to be able to take it onto a world stage? Oh, absolutely. And of course, as a basketball strength and conditioning coach, I mean, I was salivating because that was my niche. I mean, getting players stronger was what I did. So it was the perfect fit. Here I am saying, wow, this kid has all of the raw materials to be an elite player. And the only thing he's missing is me. And of course, that's how I looked at it because I was young and probably lack the humility that I needed, but I'm really thinking, wow, I can be the key that unlocks his greatness. And I was only thinking of it from a physical standpoint, not even thinking uh, how much someone like you would have been able to add value to him. So uh, I was incredibly persistent with him and his wonderful mom, Wanda, uh, to have him come in for a workout because at that point when he was 15, he had never picked up a weight in his life. He had never done any type of formal strength and conditioning training. Um, And it took a few months of convincing 
boxing, um, but he finally came in for a workout, and I absolutely hammered him. Did you know, you? early in early in my career, you know, and again, we we all get wiser with age and, and maturity. I, I always felt that the sign of a good workout when I was younger was how intense and how hard it was. And if if a player was really sore, they could barely walk, or if they threw up, then that meant it was a great workout. And if they didn't do those things, then it wasn't. And and obviously now I realize. I mean, how misinformed and misguided I was, but I mean, I absolutely laid the hammer on him. And in about 30 minutes, I mean, he could hardly tolerate any more. He was kind of laying in a pile on the floor, um, which, of course, I thought was a sign of success. Come to realize that was probably one of the worst things that I could have done for a kid on his first workout. Um, but nevertheless, what was so remarkable, at, you know, he's there laying on the ground and Kevin has always been very reserved and very shy. So he didn't say much during the workout. Uh, so I asked him if he liked it and he was as serious as can be. And he said, no, coach, I didn't, which talk about a piece of humble pie. But then the next thing he said is what shocked me. He said, no, I didn't. But I know this is what I need to do to be the best player I can be. So when can I see you again? And, and, and I remember the light bulb going off in a couple of ways. One, well, this kid didn't like my workout, so I better change some things up. But two, I mean, he just went through something that was mentally, emotionally, and physically really, really, really challenging. And yet he's willing to do it again because he knows that the sacrifice he has to make to be a great player I just, I mean, I don't know that I've ever been more impressed with a 15-year-old in my life to be able to do that. I mean, most people uh, do everything they can to alleviate themselves from any type of physical, mental, or emotional discomfort. And here was a kid willing to walk right into the eye of the storm because he knew that's what he needed to do. And, and, and that was, you know, the, the spark that, you know, he and I had a very, very solid relationship for the next few years while he was still in high school and a great training coach-player relationship um, but I, I give it to him. That was that was all him having the maturity to say, yeah, let's do this again. Um, because most people would have said, this was an awful experience. Keep me away from this guy. I don't ever want to see him again. So uh, he, he gets all the praise for that, which is why I say with that type of mentality at 15, I'm not at all surprised he's as great as he is. When you reflect back, a bit of a personal question here, when you reflect back and you had these to-be-great basketball players coming in, and I understand there were high school kids at the time, but, you know, take a Kevin Durant, who you said was this wonderful, um, if a little bit gangly, certainly for, uh, uh, an, an incredible talent. Were you nervous? Were you personally nervous about doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing? Or was that Absolutely. <laughs> oh, without question. Question. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, um, but of course, as a young coach, I mean, I was riddled with my own insecurities. You know, I'm 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 thinking, am I good enough to train a young Kevin Durant? You know, do I belong here? Um, what if he realizes that I don't know everything there is to know about strength and conditioning? You know, what if what if I do something and he doesn't like it and he never wants to see me again? Is it is it my job to stick to my convictions and do what I know? Or is it my job to cater to him to make sure he keeps me as a coach? Of course, those were all things going through my head. And, and I don't know that, that those things ever leave completely. I think over time, as you gain confidence and expertise in your craft, you can keep them at bay. Um, but, but even now, I mean, I'll be, I'll be giving a talk to, you know, corporations like Pepsi or American Express, and there'll always be that little nugget inside of me that's thinking, you know, okay, am I, do I belong here? Do, do they really want to hear what I have to say? And, you know, through, mental training and, and stuff that you share, uh, I'm, I'm able to, um, again, keep most of that at bay, but I don't think it ever leaves. But yeah, there was a ton of nervous moments, you know, not even just in that workout, in many of the ones to follow with Kevin and with other players, without question. As a, uh, as a coach, as a strength and conditioning coach, uh, uh, who was slowly acquiring a passion for the mental side of things, sports psychology, how did you, how did the gym uh, become your sort of psychological office, if you like? Because, I mean, I think the gym is a wonderful place to help 
uh, young athletes and athletes in general of any sport become mentally more skillful or mentally stronger or whatever phrase you want to use. Uh, was that just with Kevin, with others? Was that just converse, casual conversation? Were there specific techniques you'd use? Um, would you recite what you had read? How would you go about that in the early days? Well, I'm very fortunate. Even as a young kid, I've, I've always considered myself a people person. Like I enjoy connecting with other human beings, and I've always found tremendous value in connecting with others. Um, so, so holding side conversations and asking them about things outside of sport and about their lives and all that, that's just always come natural to me because, because I enjoy that part. Uh, but I'm very thankful that early in my coaching career, a coaching mentor of mine um, shared something incredibly impactful that, that reshaped how I viewed coaching for the rest of my life. And he said, you have to connect first and you coach second that the most important thing is building trust and building a connection and a solid relationship uh, where your athletes know that you truly care about them first. And once you've established that, then you can talk about footwork. Then you can talk about increasing power. Then you can talk about, you know, nutrition, but you have to connect first. So, you know, as I look back on my career, um, you know, if, if, if you were to rate me in the two areas of, uh, physiology and anatomy and movement mechanics. I mean, I think I was probably a little bit better than average. I had a pretty good understanding of that stuff, but I think I scored much higher on the EQ side uh, and the ability to have an emotional intelligence and build this connection and establish trust and, and get players to want to give me the type of effort consistently that's required for them to be great. I think I would score much higher on that side. Um, and of course, you need, I think you need both to be a, a quality coach. Um, but, but, you know, there were always trainers in the gym that knew more about the human body and more about movement and more about, you know, that type of stuff than I did. But I took a lot of pride in, in the connecting component. So, um, and that's probably where the, some of those insecurities came. I was never, ever worried that I'd be able to create a connection with Kevin. I was just worried that maybe I didn't know enough on the strength and conditioning side for a player of that level. It's funny, as you're talking there, it reminds me of a conversation on the Sports Psych show I had with a guy called Professor Damien Hughes, who's um, a leading sports and organisational psychologist in the UK, and he's just written a book on Barcelona, but he was saying to me that he went over to visit Emmanuel Stewart, who was Muhammad Ali's um, boxing coach, Yeah. and uh, <laughs> Damien said he was talking to Manny about this boxer and that boxer, and how do you coach this boxer, and Manny Stewart just said hang on Damien stop hold on just let's be clear I coach I don't coach boxers I coach people I don't uh, coach boxers I coach people so what you I said love that reminded me of that story yes that's very powerful wow that's I love that that's so insightful and that's and that's true I mean uh in my case basketball is simply the platform that's simply the vehicle you know my my purpose is much bigger than teaching someone to be good uh, at the game of basketball it, it's more about getting them to actualize and be the best version of themselves and then simply basketball is an extension of that but again these are things that I I didn't realize until later in my career I mean early I thought literally my purpose is to get him to run faster and jump higher that is my purpose and then I realized that well if you want someone to run faster and jump higher, it's nice if you build a solid relationship with them and, and you learn the ins and outs of what motivates them and what inspires them and how do they like to be shown appreciation and how do they like to be held accountable. And once I can learn all that, then getting them to run faster and jump higher is actually pretty easy. And we, we will come on to talk about you know, high performance and what high performers do before that. Um, I'd love you to tell me about Kobe Bryant, your experience of him, um, this global superstar. Tell me about Kobe Bryant. For sure. Well, you know, having lived in a basketball bubble my whole life, you know, I mean, I, I knew that Kobe was on the Mount Rushmore of, of players and, you know, certainly had admired him uh, as a fan for his whole career. Uh, and in 2007, um, Nike was holding uh, their first ever Kobe Bryant Skills Academy, and they actually hired me uh, to be the, the strength and conditioning coach for the academy, and they brought me out to Los Angeles. Uh, of course, I mean, I'm tickled to death. I'm so excited. Wow, yeah, I'm going to yeah, get a chance to work for somebody that, <laughs> that I kind of idolize. Um, and I'd always heard this urban legend just of how insanely intense his individual workouts were. I mean, everyone talked 
uh, about you know how unparalleled his workouts were and that he didn't even call them workouts. He called them blackouts because that's how hard he went. Well, I figured now that I was on camp staff, I mean, this was going to be the best chance I had, the best shot. So uh, I walked right up to him and asked if he mind if I would watch one of his private workouts. And I remember him being incredibly gracious and said, sure, man, that's no problem. And I'm going tomorrow at four. And, and I got a little confused only because I had been looking at the camp schedule. And it said that the first workouts with the kids was the next day at 3.30. Uh, and, of course, Kobe was talking about 4 a.m., you know. And, and as your listeners can probably appreciate, you know, there's not really a legitimate excuse on why you can't be somewhere at 4 in the morning. At least not an excuse that you can give Kobe Bryant. So my, but just by me asking and him extending the invitation, I basically committed to being there. And that was okay. You know, I'm an early riser by nature, so that wasn't a problem. Uh, but, but I really wanted to leave my mark, and I really wanted to impress Kobe. Uh, so I came up with a plan to beat him to the gym, you know, thinking if I'm at the gym and he shows up and I'm already there, he will remember me forever. Uh, and instead, you know, I set my alarm for 3 a.m. And, and I get to the gym about 3.30 thinking that should beat him by plenty of time. And I get there and he's already in the gym working out at 3.30. And he was already in a full sweat. He was with his trainer and he was going through an intense warm up to prepare himself for the workout that technically started at four. Uh, and, and that alone kind of blew my mind. Um, but piggybacking onto how we started the conversation, I remember being shocked when I watched his workout because uh, the first 45 minutes, he was doing some of the most basic drills that, that I knew of. I mean, he was doing basic offensive moves and basic pivoting and footwork drills. And I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, my expectation as a novice coach going in was that he was going to be doing the flashiest and sexiest drills I've ever seen. I mean, I, I was expecting to see, you know, uh, him juggling fire or him being blindfolded or who knows. Um, and instead he was, he was working on mastering the basics. And, and that was really where I learned that lesson because his workout did last a couple hours and true to form. His work ethic and effort and focus was unparalleled, uh, and he did everything with surgical precision, um, but it was still very basic stuff, and, and that still confused me. So later that day at camp, um, you know, I went up to him again and said, Kobe, I don't understand. You're the best player in the world. Why do you do such basic stuff? And, and that was when he gave me that line that I never get bored with the basics. Like the reason I'm the best player in the world is because I'm committed to mastering my craft, and the only way I can do that is is to, to have an appreciation and respect for the basics. And, and that changed me forever because, you know, at that time in my life, I was always chasing the shiny objects. I was always trying to find the shortcut to the advanced stuff. And I don't need the basics. Give me the good stuff. Mm. And to find out that a player like Kobe lives in the basics, you know, certainly changed my perception because I'm thinking if the best player in the world can – can work on mastering the basics than me as a coach, I better do the same thing. And, and, you know, so that was a really monumental time. And, and what's funny is he probably doesn't even remember that. Like that's just another day to him getting up that early and mastering the basics. But that day absolutely changed my life forever. Wow. Wow. So you've given us some golden nuggets already, but what, what do high performers do? You know, you're, you're, you're illustrating some of the experiences you've had with some of the best athletes on the planet and you've talked about you've you, you've spoken about the fundamentals the basics i know that when you speak to audience you talk about heightening self-awareness and improving productivity and creating winning habits inspiring teamwork uh, maximizing impact but what's another after that, that that fundamental piece what's another thing that you found that high performers do well, the number one thing, so uh, as I mentioned, Mind Gym was the, the first spark that, that let me even realize that there are people that do what it is that you do so well. But the first time I met somebody in person, uh, boy, it's been at least 10 years now, but was a gentleman named Graham Betchart, um, and he does similar mental skills training to what you do, and he lives in San Francisco, um, and he was the one that taught me the concept to play present. Uh, or now to live present, which is to really be focused on the present moment. And, and that alone was what shifted my definition of what it means to be mentally tough. See, with, without knowing the stuff that you currently know, 
I always thought mental toughness was kind of a derivative of physical toughness. Like if you could, if you could run sprints until you threw up, you were mentally tough. If you could do a wall sit for 10 minutes with a sandbag on your head while coaches are screaming and dropping the F bomb at you, you were mentally tough if you didn't cry. Like I, I didn't have an understanding of what mentally tough meant. And, and Graham kind of led me down the path to believing that mental toughness, um, for the most part is being able to, to be in the present moment mm. and eliminate unnecessary distractions and i know that's not an all-encompassing definition of mental toughness but i do think it's a pillar of it and and to me that's what that's what shapes high performers is you know and and what i've come to conclude and this is where i would love your feedback and expertise um that living in the present moment uh has three pillars the first is you only focus on the next play because it's the only one you can do anything about. So forget the one that just happened. Focus on the next one. Uh, two, focus on what you have control over, which is your attitude and your effort. And then three, just focus on the process. Don't focus on the wall. Focus on laying one perfect brick at a time. And if you can do those three things, then in essence, you're, you're in the present moment. And for me, uh, that's been a theme that I've noticed from every high performer uh, whether it's basketball players, whether it's coaches, but even those in the business world, and even myself, even as a father of three young kids, I become a better father the moment I'm, you know, the moment I'm present, and the moment I realize, uh, you know, that I'm living to those three pillars. So for me, I think one thing that unites all high performers is the ability to be focused on the present moment. And I think what's interesting there is you talk about being a parent and you talk about the business world. I actually think what's interesting is that I agree with you. It is being in the present moment. And I love your three pillars, if you like, the focus on the next play, the control the controllables, focus on what you can control, uh, be into the process or execute the process. And I think that when you're a when you're a parent that that's so much of your day isn't it and when you're in the business world you have to do that so often in the sports world you could argue you've got to do those things in training absolutely of course you've got to practice them but those acute performance moments come come around once a week on match day or on game day but as a parent and as a businessman or businesswoman you're going to get so many of those performance moments during the day that you've got to perfect or you've got to execute to the very best of your ability. So I think those three pillars are just as relevant to the population as a whole, not just to sports people. For sure. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy my work is because I do believe it bleeds over into every area of our life. Mm. Like you and I may be focused on sport, Mm. but all of the stuff that it takes to be a high performer in sport can translate to any other area. And, and I also believe that, that we perform in every area of our life. Like I want my performance as a father to continually improve. I want my performance as a speaker to improve, my performance as a business owner to, perform, to improve. And even if I'm going to go pl- to the park and play basketball with my buddies, I want that performance to be as high as it can be. And, and I know without question that the folks that have mentored me to be a better coach – uh, have also mentored me to be a better father, and they don't even realize it because that's not what we were focused on. But these things absolutely cross over uh, and transcend every area of our life. It's interesting because you're talking there, and I'm thinking about your pillars and this notion of staying in the present. Being present-minded, staying in the present, is the the tough task is being present-minded. It's not just staying in the present, it's being present-minded. And to be present-minded, you've got to be very intentional with what you do a lot of the time. I think as human beings, we tend to rely too much on automaticity. We kind of, and I understand in the sporting world, um, executing your skills automatically is this divine elixir of just do it, don't think about it. But there has to be a part of sporting skill where you do have to... uh, think about what you're doing you do have to check in with yourself on the course yes or the pitch but in your everyday life as well it's parenting with intention it's living with intention it's it's working uh with intention i think staying in the present what you're saying to me has got me thinking about yes staying in the present but being present minded it's being intentionally minded 
I love that distinction. Yeah, I'm I'm going to steal that and, and give some more reflection to that because I, I think it is. I, I love that you brought that up. Incredibly insightful. I think it's a level up from that. I would imagine that that just being in the present moment for someone that's incredibly distracted and scattered, mm-hmm. being in the present moment might be the first step, and then you graduate to being more present minded. That that I think with a lot of things there are there are different levels and there's different steps that we we need to be able to get to. And yeah, you just put that perfectly well it links it links back to what you said about the best basketball players and and how they worked on their fundamental fundamentals but they didn't just work on their fundamentals they they focused on their fundamentals they were intentional with their fundamentals they they were deliberate with everything that they did so when you were watching kobe or you were spending time with kevin durant i, I i'm i'm guessing what you were observing was intentionality and and being deliberate in that present moment Yes, and and it's still it, no. You're absolutely right with that, and it's still their commitment to excellence in everything that they do. And I think that also stems to their their relentless obsession to be better um, and their competitiveness. But if you think of how most of the world does things, like like right now, so I have eight year old twin sons and I have a six year old daughter, so they're on the younger end. But if if one of my sons came in right now and I said, "All right, I need you to go clean your room," he would more than likely do the least amount possible that he thinks that he thinks I'm going to be okay with. So he, he's going to kind of put his toys away and, and make sure his clothes are stuffed in his drawer uh, just enough that when I walk in the room that I'll say, okay, this looks good. Uh, but see, a high performer would go in and they would make the bed with military corners. They would refold their clothes and make sure they're stacked perfectly in the drawer. Uh, they would check to see if there was dust on their dresser and then they would vacuum. That's the difference. Now, obviously, I don't expect that from an eight-year-old. When I was eight, I would have done the same thing, but it's, it's that mindset. It's if I'm going to do something, then I might as well do it to the best of my ability, and I do believe that that ends up becoming a habit. That becomes a behavior. You just get used to that's the way you do things. So when you've programmed your whole life to be that way, then when you go into the gym and you know you're going to spend 15 minutes working on footwork drills, you don't half-ass it. You don't mail it in and go through the motions. You do it to the best of your ability because that's how you do everything. And that doesn't mean that you're good at everything, but I've noticed that the best players, they also gave a great effort in the classroom. Now, they might not have gotten the best grades. They might not have been the smartest kids I've ever met, but they gave a great effort because they know that, that those types of things should not be an on – there should not be an on and off switch, that you do the best that you're capable of in everything that you do. And when you do that enough times – that's just kind of the way you're wired. And, you know, of course, there's exceptions to that. I'm not implying that everyone can be at 100 every day, no. but that's the mindset. And to me as a parent, since I've already told you that going back, I wish I would have had a better understanding of the mental stuff as a kid. That's one of the most important things that I try to share with my children. And I talk about being present with them all of the time. And I talk about, you know, when I do go in and check their room and say, hey, look at that. You know that you should have put it away differently, didn't you? Yes, you know that. Well, why didn't you? Because now I'm going to make you do it anyway, so you could have done it right the first time. And and to me as a parent, that, that's one of the best gifts that I can give my children is to start teaching them to be present-minded and to do the type of stuff that, that you share. And as you say that it's challenging as a human being to be on 100, 100% all the time, but you're going to be 100% on the things that are most meaningful to you. Yes. So as you're alluding to there for you as a parent, if you go back to Kobe Bryant there at four, five o'clock in the morning, well, he's he's being deliberate and intentional because that, that basketball game of his is the most meaningful thing in his life at that time. And I, I think what's interesting about that is when you are on 100, it's, it's exhausting, you're burning away those glucose and those sugars yes. in the front part of your brain so it makes your rest and recuperation time even more important doesn't it i mean that that that, that would have been a big part of your world i'm guessing as an s and c coach as a strengthening and conditioning coach is that that downtime getting the balance between effort and energy and then having that rest and recuperation Oh, absolutely. And, and you're right. It's To me, it's not that you need to be at 100 in everything that you do. It's just more of the awareness and the mindset and yeah. the connection that uh, how, how well I clean my room 
is a choice. Yeah. And I either choose to do it to the best of my ability or I choose not to. And, and I think it's important for all of us to hold ourselves to a level of accountability that when we choose not to or we choose not to give our best effort in something, that, that we own it and we admit it. And sometimes because we do, our resources are finite. So yes, it doesn't make sense to spread ourselves thin and try to be a hundred in every different area. You know, that's why I, I really embrace finding the things that we're really good at and doubling down on those and then disregarding a lot of the other things. You know, um, in, in the NBA, for example, uh, you've got, I don't know, maybe 12 to 15 players that are like LeBron that can kind of do a little bit of everything. I mean, they're, they're the freaks. They can, they can pass, they can rebound, they can score, they can defend. But outside of the top 12 to 15, the other 450 players in the league are role players. They are specialists. They have one skill, sometimes two, that they do at an elite world-class level. Um, a perfect example would be players that are, that are great shooters. You know, a Clay Thompson or a Kyle Korver or a J.J. Redick. Those guys get paid a lot of money to do one thing, catch and shoot catch and shoot, catch and shoot. So they don't try to give a hundred in all of the different areas. Uh, they try to make sure that they have razor sharp precision in that one area so that they can be world class. And, and, and that's something to think about. And, and then as you just perfectly teed up, yes, the rest and recovery component, uh, whether it's mental and emotional rest or physical rest is vital to performance. And that's another area um, that as I look back on my young coaching career, I didn't give it the respect that it deserved. I came from the school of more is better. And the more effort we can put forth for longer periods of time, for more days of the week is better. And that, that old misguided adage that if you're not working out, the other guy is. And when you meet him, he's going to beat you. And now I look at it differently. I think, well, if that guy's working 24 seven and I'm strategic with my rest and recovery, I'm going to beat him whenever we line up because he's going to be exhausted. So uh, the rest and recovery component, yeah, is incredibly, incredibly important. And that's one of the things that I find, you know, a lot of coaches, players, but even folks in the business world, they struggle with because they've been taught that the constant grind and the 24 hours of work is what's best. You know, most of what I talk about with athletes now to improve their performance, how can you improve your quality of sleep? How can you find some times to you know, make sure that you're hydrated and you have good no nutrition? That in fact, today would be a great day to take off completely so that tomorrow you feel like 100 instead of going in and gutting it out today and feeling like a 75 today and then you're going to feel like a 55 tomorrow. So again, with age, hopefully some maturity and some newfound wisdom, uh, that stuff becomes so much more important. The last thing to say on this subject or last question to ask is is related to what you've just said there. When you reflect back over the last 20 years of, of being around some of the best basketball players in the world, would you say that quality of practice and quality of approach, if you like, uh, trumps quantity, trumps the quality work, trumps the hard work? Yes, without question. You know, on some level, once you have a decent level of mastery with a skill, so first you have to learn the skill, and then you need to be able to replicate it at game speed uh, for there to be the highest level of, of transfer. Um, so uh, a perfect example would be I have kids all the time. They'll shoot me a message on Instagram and say, you know, hey, coach, I was in the gym shooting for three hours this morning. And I'm thinking, OK, well, I know that that wasn't very quality work because there's no way that you can go at game speed for three hours. You're, what you're doing is you're casually shooting. You know, you're in there just kind of going at your own pace. And, and uh, there's, there's, there's a time and a place for all different aspects of training. But if you're really looking to raise your game and to be able to, to transfer what you're doing in workouts and practice to a game, then you need to replicate that with the same level of focus and intensity. So when I have a player say, you know, I just went in for 45 minutes and I, I shot as many game shots from game spots at game speed as I could. And, you know, then I know that that person gets it and gets what you just said, that the quality 
is way more important than the quantity. Uh, over time, the quantity will accumulate, and, and you'll get those reps, and you'll lay those bricks because repetition is important. Uh, but but yeah, the 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 quantity is or quality rather is so much more important, and it comes down to your standard of excellence. You know, um, uh, Stephen Curry, who most people have heard of today, yeah, course, yeah. was actually one of he was one of the college counselors at that Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. So this was before anyone knew who he was. And uh, long story very short, at the very end of the first workout, he asked me if I would rebound for him because he wasn't going to leave the gym until he swished five free throws in a row. And for someone that, if, if anyone listening has not shot a basketball before, that's a really, really, really high standard. I mean, a swish is a perfect shot. It doesn't touch the rim. It doesn't touch the backboard. And, and he wasn't going to leave until he swished four in a row. Well, you said you were a golfer. Let's just say that you weren't going to leave, you know, the putting green until you made 10, 10 foot putts in a row or something to that I'd nature. I'd still be there, uh, Alan. I'd still be yes, there. 10 years of, later, I can show of, you my putting. Of course. <laughs> and, 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 that's, and that's the level, you know, that yeah. Stefan held himself to. And, yeah. and I believe when he retires at that time, he'll be the greatest shooter in NBA history. And, and it's because he was willing to hold himself to a high standard and he was focused so much more on quality and not quantity and it's also important to note that you know standards are something that we accept it's not what we talk about it's not what we put about on instagram it's what we accept and he would not accept leaving the gym until he swished five in a row and and i'm not saying that that any athlete listening to this right now needs to make 10 10 foot putts or swish five in a row but you need to find a standard of excellence that's appropriate for you and hold yourself to that and don't allow anything to pull you beneath it and then of course you can level up as you start to master it i never had the conversation with him but i feel very confident in saying that steph probably started when he was younger with something like i'm going to make two free throws in a row before i leave and then over time when that become you know he's mastered that and then i'm not going to leave until i make five in a row and then i'm not going to leave until i swish two in a row and he probably continued to level up as he got better uh but it but it all comes down to our standards and if you have incredibly high standards and you have high focus and you give a great effort then you really don't need a a ton of quantity when it comes to your workouts it's the quality that matters absolutely and um talking about quality um exciting times for you you have a book out called raise your game Tell us about that book. How did that? Why have you written it? What's it about? Um, take us through. Take us through that book. Well, it, the the book, for one, it was a professional bucket list item. You know, I know how much books have impacted me in my life. I've been a voracious reader ever since college, and uh, there's nothing better than just getting a good book and 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 having my eyes light up when I read something new. Um, you know that that's going to have an impact on me, like we've mentioned a couple times now with Mind Gym. So you know, for me, the thought that that over time. I might have enough to say that someone else would want to read and get a similar feeling was really something that was important to me. And, and I've always felt kind of this, this duty, if you will, that I've been around some really great players and some great coaches who have taught me stuff. And I know that I've, I've been able to see some things that most people aren't privy to. So it's kind of my obligation to pay that forward and to share that with others. You know, not all of your listeners have had a chance to watch Kobe Bryant work out. So it's my obligation to kind of paint that picture and share the lesson that I learned so that they can benefit. And I, I feel an obligation to do that because of how many people have done that for me, how many coaches and trainers and people like yourself have mentored me. So I just want to kind of pay that pay that forward. So that was the first reason for writing the book. Um, and the second was it really forced me to organize 20 years of professional experience. It really forced me to go back and do a brain dump and mm. curate all of the stories and lessons and, and nuggets that people have shared with me and put them in one organized spot. Um, and I say this truthfully, even if I didn't publish the book, even if I didn't make it available for sale, it was worth writing because it forced me to get hyper aware uh, and, and focused on all of the stuff that, that I had learned over the years. And it, it caused me to kind of organize it. And, and that was a lot of fun. You know, the, the book's organized into three sections. There's a section for players, a section for coaches, and a section for teams. And, of course, that translates to the business world. So that's, you know, the player would be the employee, uh, the coach would be the CEO, and then the team would be the organization. Um, but what I want to make sure people know is – 
regardless of what you think you are, you're always going to be moving back and forth amongst those three different spots. You know, even if, if you were a golfer, which is technically an individual sport, there's still other people on your team that have an influence over you and your performance. Um, and, and sometimes you're the player and sometimes you're the coach. You know, you might be the employee at your business, but then you come home and you're the head coach of your family because now you're a father or a mother. So we're always going back and forth. So it's not like I want players to only read the first five chapters and then put it away. And coaches, you only read chapters six through ten. No, uh, everybody needs to get a uh, to be able to familiarize yourself with all three because all three will help you be a more influential leader, a more impactful teammate. And to have the skills to curate a group of people that are a winning team. And and that was kind of how the book was put together. And and it was written very deliberately that it would benefit a sport coach or player as well as someone that's in the business world. There are business examples in there that sport coaches and players can and will should learn from as well as most of what I've shared, which are sports stories that other people can take from. When we spoke on the podcast that we met on, you uh, talked a lot, and I really loved this because I'm passionate about this as well, uh, and I'm talking about the coach piece, the leadership piece here, um, the importance of player-led teams rather than being too top-down with your leadership. Talk to us a bit about that because I'm sure that's a big part of your book, but tell us a bit it about is. the importance of, of, of allowing your, whether it's your staff or your players to lead. I believe, you know, a team shouldn't have a leader. A team should be made up of leaders. And, and really, I define a leader as anyone uh, that can have a positive influence over someone else's behavior. So um, people will be given different levels of authority. Uh, I understand that the head coach has been given more authority than the 15th man on a basketball team. But that doesn't mean that the 15th man can't be a leader and that the 15th man can't also have a positive impact over the behavior of his teammates or his coaches uh, or of practice. So uh, I think it's important that for any organization, whether it's a soccer club, a basketball team, or a business, that leadership and accountability are not just vertical, they're also horizontal, Mm -hmm. that everybody is trying to lead and hold everyone else accountable. And and the best organizations I've been around, teams as well, the, the head coach or the CEO they don't believe they're above anyone else. They realize they're at the top of the org chart. Like they get that, but they're not above the standards. They're not above being held accountable that they don't, it's not do as I say, uh, it's do as I do. And, and if someone in the organization can hold them accountable for what they're not doing, they're open to receiving that type of coaching. And I I think that's, that's vital. And yes, on a basketball team in between, you're going to have your starting five, and you're going to have your star player, and you're going to have guys that play more than others. Um, but the best teams, they respect everyone's role on the team. Uh, they allow everyone to have a voice and to lead, and everyone is held to the same level of accountability. You know, if the 15th man shows up late for practice and he's treated different than if the star player shows up late for practice, then I think you have some dysfunction and you have a problem. What, when you talk to coaches about that philosophy, that player-led philosophy um when you perhaps you talk to ceos as well about this what pushback do you tend to have there i'm a big believer in what you've just explained i think having a player-led a staff-led culture is so so important i think giving players autonomy mm. responsibility uh, helps you to help them become accountable. But I know having had conversations with coaches uh, who have tended to be quite directive, quite top down, quite instructional. If they push back anywhere, it's fear. It's fear of yep. chaos. And, and well, if I'm not in control, if they don't feel like they're in control, then it feels very out of control to them. They think it will all go wrong. What, what pushback have you found? You just nailed it. And that usually stems from an insecurity that, that one, uh, on one level, we all want to feel like we matter. I mean, of course, you know, on some selfish 
primitive level. We all kind of want to feel uh, that if I leave, this whole thing will crumble because I'm that important. And, you know, that's that's really deep rooted. And I think a little bit of that is probably understandable for all of us. Uh, but over time, uh, the best leaders had the humility to acknowledge that if I leave and this thing keeps running brilliantly, that's actually a compliment. To me, that's not a derogation to me. That is a compliment that helped establish the culture that can run without. If you've created an organization or a team where accountability and leadership uh, is not just vertical, it's also horizontal, mm -hmm. where everybody has a say and everybody has a voice and, and everybody is leading everyone else, um, then you've created something really special and unique, uh, almost to the tune that if you didn't show up, this whole thing would run perfectly without you, um, is I think the best a uh, compliment that you could give a coach or could give someone that has been given that position of authority. So usually when coaches give pushback on that, it's it's from insecurity and fear, uh, but hopefully they can get over that hump. You know, because I do believe that a player-led team will always outperform a coach-led team in the long run. And of course, we're talking ones of similar talent. I mean, you can't, it's hard to outcoach talent, but um yeah, I think that's that's vital. And it, I find with most coaches, they're more embracing of it as they get older and as they get more experienced. Because usually the older and more experienced you get and mature as a coach, you realize, hey, it ain't about me. It's about them. Or it ain't about me. It's about us. And to me, the sign of a great leader is one that can empower other leaders and get them to, to raise their game. Yeah, I think it's twofold, isn't it, Alan? It, it, if I'm constantly instructing and I'm co constantly telling uh, players, athletes what to do, then they're not being given the opportunity to brainstorm, to problem solve, to find solutions on their own. And so exactly. when they do come up against challenges on the course or the course or the pitch, they won't necessarily have the capacity, the mental flexibility to be able to find those solutions. Um, I think the other thing and related to that is, look, as a coach, you know, you're not out there yourself. You're not on the right. course, or the course or the pitch. And so, you know, w w you want players who are, imp you know, who are good enough and empowered well enough to be able to problem solve. So passing over that power, it's that power piece, isn't it? Passing over that power to players, you know, shouldn't be scary. It might feel scary at times, but it, it, yeah. it, it shouldn't be because you're empowering them to make key decisions in those acute performance moments. Exactly. And what you just said so perfectly, decision making is a skill mm. and decision making takes practice and we have to get our reps. So if you're making every single decision for your players, then they're not getting any practice to do that. And as you just said, then once the light comes on and the referee blows the whistle, they have to be the one that makes the decisions because you can't be on the court with them uh, and you've robbed them of that ability. And it's it's funny because if I had to summarize my parenting philosophy you just did it right there even at young ages i try to give my children as much autonomy as possible to make their own decisions and practice making their own decisions and living with the consequences of those decisions because that's what i want them to do i don't want to in you know, uh, insulate them in this bubble until they leave home at 18 and they've never practiced making any decision on their own. Because as we all know, you know, we, we make bad decisions. You know, we make them in life. We make them on the court. We make them in business. So the more you can practice with bad decisions, then the better you'll get at making good decisions. And that's ultimately what experience is. So any chance I get uh, to give my children autonomy um, and to give the players I work with autonomy, uh, I, I try and take that. And uh, again, that that requires some confidence as a coach that you have the right people on your team and that they're going to make the right decisions over time. And then when they do make a poor decision, uh, even if they, they misread uh, a play or whatever, uh, then there's a chance for a learning opportunity. And that's when you can you can stop and you can actually coach and not just do a series of drills. And you can say, what were you thinking on that play right there? When you made that pass, why did you feel that was the right pass to make? Because clearly it wasn't, but I want to see how you process that. So maybe I can give you something that will allow you to make the right pass next time instead of just telling them what to do. Fantastic.
Now, last question, because I'm mindful of your time and you, you used the important word, the vital word, team, several times in uh, the last couple of minutes. And I know that a big passion of yours is to help players, team, help organization, team, teamship is a big thing. Um, and I know that in the book you talk about being me driven versus being we driven how do you help teams be we driven as opposed to me driven how do you help players team well you know one thing that that over time i've come to realize and it's not that being me driven is bad Hmm. it just can't override or undermine the we driven portion in fact i think having a certain level of me drive if it's done in the right context and for the right reasons actually helps the we drive that, that, that that it's okay for players to have some internal selfish tendencies, as long as they undermine the the vision or the goal of what the team is trying to do. You know, so for example, uh, if a basketball player says to himself, you know, uh, I want to be a McDonald's all American. That's, that's one of the highest levels of accolade you can get as a high school basketball player in the United States. I want to be a McDonald's all American. Well, that can be valuable if you do so within what we're trying to achieve as a team. If you realize that setting up your teammates and being a leader and self and unselfish and playing great defense and helping us win more games, that will raise your chance of being a McDonald's All-American, then those two things can coexist. But if you say that, you know, I'm going to shoot the ball every time down the court because I need to average 30 a game or I'll never have a chance of being a McDonald's All-American, that's when it becomes destructive. So, you know, for within the confines of the team, if you get the right me's, then you can develop the right we. And, you know, as far as a team, some people just tend to think, well, if we're all wearing the same color jersey, we're a team. And that's not necessarily what a team is. You know, a team is a group of people that truly cares about one another, that is willing to sacrifice some of their own needs and own agenda and and own drives for the betterment of the group and to be focused on what's best for the collective, not just what's best for themselves. And when you can get a group of people that are willing to make those sacrifices and that type of commitment, uh, then you have something really special. And, and that also plays into the role, you know, a, a we driven team, each individual says to themselves, what does the team need for me? And how can, how can I best add value to the team not simply what's best for me. And, you know, of course, every player wants to play every minute of the game. But if it's best for the team that they don't, then they have to be willing to concede. Interesting. There's two things I've written down there. I'm writing down lots of notes, which is fantastic. And there's a couple of things I've written down. What I love about what you did there is, for me, I heard you frame individual excellence within team excellence. Yes. You know, to to get on that McDonald's basketball team, you know, that that's that's a great individual goal to have. How can I accomplish that within my team? You know, I often uh, say to players, um, be the best individual you can be and the best teammate. Be the best teammate and the best Love individual that. you can be. I mean, it, it, they, they, there's, you've kind of alluded to, they do go hand in hand. And then what I love about what you've gone on to say is you posed the question what does the team need from me and i and i think that individual athletes within team games like basketball like soccer uh, and other team sports they can feel so much pressure going into a match uh for themselves that they mm-hmm. become very tunnel visioned about I'm nervous, I'm anxious, like what have I got to do? What have I got to do? What what's my role here? What's coach said about me? What's my responsibilities within my role? What actions have I got to do? So you become very me oriented because of the pressure. <laughs> and I and yes. I love that notion of you you know, have that, that's fine, that's okay. You know, you've got to go through that in your mind. You've got to mentally rehearse what you've got to do. But you've also got to pose that question what does the team need for me on Saturday? What does the team need for me on Sunday when we go and compete? So what have I got to do within this pressurized moment? Well, how am I going to react and respond to adverse moments? And what does the team need from me? Yes. And that needs to be constantly reinforced and emphasized. And that's where we all need to hold each other accountable within the confines of a team. Um, because I do think that many selfish tendencies 
are natural. I think they're in our DNA. I think, you know, as, as little kids, we're taught the self-preservation of I got to look out for myself and know and give me that and somebody feed me and somebody change me just for mere survival. So it's these selfish tendencies are often very understandable, but it doesn't make them acceptable. Just because something's understandable, it doesn't mean that it's acceptable. And I think as coaches and players, we have to recognize that. So do I understand why a kid would want to go try and score 30 points because he wants to be a McDonald's All-American? Yes, I can understand that. But it doesn't mean that it's okay within the confines of our team. And if I'm a coach or a player, then I want to be able to teach that person how to use that inner drive of excellence for themselves for everybody else how can everybody else benefit from the fact that you want to be the best that you can be and that was always my closing statement to the team when they were going to leave for the summer was very first step to improving our team is improving yourself so you make sure when you go home for the summer that you're focused on being the best that you can be and then when you come back when school starts again we'll plug you into you know with everybody else and we'll all get better by default and and talking about closing statements, so I'm going to make a closing statement, and and I'd, I'd like you to to comment on this. Um, this has been a fa- fantastic and fascinating um, hour and ten, hour and fifteen minutes. It, it's flown by, and and thank you so much. And I think so much of what you've said, Alan, is from your experiences, the twenty fifteen twenty years of experiences you've had with some of the best athletes in the world, basketball players, the best basketball players in the world. You've laid down a blueprint for what high performance looks like. I know your 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 book lays down a blueprint for leadership, world class leadership, world class teaming or teamship, building teams. And so much of what you've said I recognize within athletes I've worked with and so much I often say on the sports site show there's a difference between simple and easy there's a difference between uh-huh. simple and easy and so much of what you you said sounds so simple but but it's they're not easy to do and so often our personality traits, our dispositional traits. I mean, being a, a psychologist, I, I'm passionate about personality science. And, um, you know, you've talked about uh, Kevin Durant and, and Kobe Bryant and all the, the effort and the sacrifices they've made and, and how they train effectively. And it sounds to me that they were quite high conscientious Okay, I'm really putting my psychologist's cap on here. Uh, I love it. But, Keep it going. But, but they're very high conscientious, and it, and it's not everybody has that in abundance. But for me, and I wouldn't do the job I do without believing this, I believe that people can learn to be more high conscientious in the situations that they need to be so if I yes. love soccer and I want to be a soccer player or I want to be a golfer or I want to be a basketball player and I'm passionate about it and I'm good at it and I may have the physique like Kevin Durant didn't necessarily have and he built it with you maybe um maybe I don't or I don't quite have the conscientiousness that that, that a Kobe or Kevin uh, had in the past, I can learn that. I can get up in the morning, I can set my alarm, I can write some stuff down that I'm going to try to accomplish on that day. I can catch the thoughts that say, oh no, just don't bother this time. Um, everything, there's been a real strand through what you've said that I think that um, high conscientious people find easy or easier to do, not easy to do, but easier to do, but people can learn to do it. So I'd just like you to comment on that because you will have seen a lot of people come and go, a lot of people succeed and fail. Do you believe that as well, Alan, that not everybody um, genetically has that or has a biological predisposition to what Kobe and Kevin can do, but to me, everybody can get some shift to get closer to that kind of conscientiousness. Absolutely. And not only do I believe it, I'd like to be believe that, that I'm living proof of it and that I could be a case study for that because I, I firmly believe I have a much higher level uh, of conscientiousness and just of general consciousness and awareness now um, than I've had at any other point in my life. So it is absolutely something that can be learned, something that can be practiced and conditioned through proper repetition and awareness uh, without question. And, and really, it's the key to all of us 
being the best version of ourselves that's possible. I mean, even as we said earlier, in my belief, even if I became the best version of myself possible, I don't think I had the physical skills to play in the NBA. No. And that's okay. I, I'm okay with that because I know that I'll be able to maximize every other area of my life. And yet there's, you know, there's tens of thousands of people out there who did have the physical skills to play in the NBA and they never were able to actualize it because of lack of conscientiousness and the things that you just mentioned. So um, it's all about us being the best that we're capable of. And I know that sounds a little overplayed and cheesy and cliche, but as I get older, I really embrace that. And, you know, when you're younger, you're always trying to play the comparison game. Am I better than this player? Am I better than him? Am I better? And it really doesn't matter. All you have to ask is, are you the best that you're capable of being? And the closer you can get to your full potential, the better. And when you're older, you'll have peace with that. Even if you're not better than the guy next to you, as long as you're the best that you can be, you'll be able to sleep well at night. At least I know I can. Well said, sir. So, uh, I know you would have tapped, your enthusiasm would have tapped a lot of interest out there. So, how can, Alan, how can people find your work and uh, your book and how can they get in contact with you? If they'd like any information on the book, they can go to Raise Your Game Book. Dot com and if they'd like any information just on me um, what I do from a speaking standpoint and so forth they can just go to allensteinjr.com uh, and I try to be really active on social media so I'm at Allenstein Jr on all of the major social platforms I love talking shop with coaches and players so if anybody listening um, you know sends me a message on Instagram or something I'll make sure to get back to you uh, this has been a real pleasure I, I knew you know from our previous um, interview together that we were going to have a lot of fun today and and I appreciate the work that you're doing and I always learn something new every time you and I interact so uh, yeah you don't have to twist my arm hard for you and I to chat anytime well I'm sure we'll do so again and, and thank you so much I know you're a very busy man and thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Sports Psych Show well everyone that was Alan Stein Jr and wasn't that fantastic I really 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 enjoyed that podcast some of those stories were absolutely fantastic and I'd love to hear what you the listener thinks so please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website at danabrahams.com to tell me exactly what you think of the sports site show and if you have any suggestions i'd be delighted to hear them i'm really looking forward to next week's episode bye for now